Welcome to another episode of Growth Hacker TV. I'm Bronson Taylor, and today I have Dan Fagella with us. Dan, thanks for coming on the program. Hey, glad to be here, Bronson. Really happy to be here, bro. I've been following the show for quite some time, so cool to, cool to be in touch. That's awesome. I think we have a good uh, interview here because, uh, one, you know what you're doing, and two, you're full of energy. <laughs> I already yeah. know that just from talking to you for the last few minutes. <laughs> and so I think that's going to come through and people are going to see your passion. Uh, but let me tell people about you a little bit. You're the founder of scienceofskill.com. You're the founder of clvboost.com. You're a national martial arts champion and Amazon number one best-selling author. So it seems like you figured this internet thing out a little bit, right? <laughs> Uh, a little bit, a little bit. You know, I don't know if the martial arts helped at all, but um, well, people you know. were afraid to compete with you. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, they they knew they knew I just destroy them in SEO, so they just let me tap them right out. I did, but, that's uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, no. They, yeah, I've been online for a little bit, man. So so yeah, for sure. There's certainly the the areas I know best. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, we'll start kind of talking about your science of skill company, yeah. but then we'll move into CLV Boost in a second. Because it'll kind of follow the natural trajectory of you yep. as a business person. And so people can kind of see how things have unfolded for you. So let's start with Science of Skill. What is Science of Skill? What do you sell? What is it? Yeah, so Science of Skill um, LLC is a company where we sell martial arts training uh, products. So I'm, uh, again, national Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu champion. No Gi Pan Ams is a tournament that I compete in. I'm a, a grappler, a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu guy. And um, I ended up going to the University of Pennsylvania for my graduate degree in positive psych and focusing on skill development. I thought to myself, you know, I'm really obsessed with uh, human potential and performance. Um, I love the martial arts. It's what I was doing all day, teaching seminars and classes and things like that at the time. So I figured, you know, if I could put a camera on this, it wouldn't really take that much more time to create content. And we could sell it on the internet. So that's what I ended up doing. And now we have a number of different continuity and, and membership levels. Uh, we have skill development coaching and consulting with martial high level martial arts athletes and gym owners uh, literally from Argentina to Canada um, and uh, and we also sell a lot of digital products mostly digital products online nice so you're kind of in e-commerce you're in SaaS you're in consulting I mean you kind of do it all right there right yeah yeah well we really want I, I really wanted to um, you know I aim to nail the aspects I was nailing so we really went continuity first mm -hmm. almost similar to growth hacker TV in, in mm -hmm. some respects um, but uh, but we just I, I wanted some of those other price points to be able to pop in and there's people that yes. want you at different levels right mm -hmm. so there's there's always going to be X number out of a thousand who are buyers who will buy whatever you give them mm -hmm. um, we're just interested in different modes of learning so we put up uh, applications for consulting and coaching and we made sure the the price points you know were, were adequate to the point where it'd be it'd be more than worth our time um, and if we could kind of plug that in and just the people that were interested would ride it and then mm -hmm. otherwise everybody else would follow the same track we did kind of plug in those other uh, those other facets so yeah we, we ended up doing a lot of it yeah that's awesome chance. great tips so tell us about the growth of science of skill I don't know what you can disclose but you know how much oh, you've fine. sold how much product you push your revenue yeah, just whatever yeah, yeah. you can tell us oh I, I'll, I'm happy to lay it out when I was uh, I've been on other interviews and you know actually sent over balance sheets and things like that. So anybody <laughs> yeah. that wants to is really Super curious. Super transparent. <laughs> um, yeah, uber transparent. I'm just I kind of live by that. But um, but yeah, for us, so we we went from uh, zero to seventeen thousand a month in about five months. Wow. Um, and then and then over the course of maybe fourteen months, we started at the uh, we're at maybe thirty five forty or so. And then there was some consulting that we started doing with again academy owners and and uh, and things like that. That's get that's. Currently, it's own LLC, mm -hmm. but it's technically there. a kind of skill business. I mean, it's that email list that's responsible for it. So ultimately, it's that. So so about 40, uh, 40 a month uh, cruising at this point. Now we're building other businesses and really sort of aiming to what I call Tim Ferriss, the science of skill business. Uh -huh. uh, just simply because I only say it because everybody will understand, right? Yeah, they want. know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, that, that's that's what we've done. And so now we're at, we're pretty much at that level. We have a product launch coming up. I'm hoping to have... Uh, my first few fifty thousand dollar months in the coming months, mm -hmm. um, and just just really up the level in those continuity programs. So that's where we are now. And again, mostly that's monthly on fifty seven dollar programs, twenty seven dollar programs. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of folks that'll take you know seventy seven, ninety seven dollar upsells. And then of course we'll have those few folks uh, that'll spend the five or six or seven hundred on our highest premier products. And that really gotcha. adds to the bottom line as well. No, that's awesome. Now let's talk about the details of kind of how you've gotten there, right? Because it yeah. seems like there's a few big things in the mix. I'm sure there's a you know a million micro decisions yeah. that made it happen. There seems to be a few really big things. Talk to me first about strategic partnerships. How important has that been for you guys? 
Oh, super duper important. So um, since very early on, I knew that um, there's a number of ways to get yourself out there in front of people, of course. Mm -hmm. And for me, um, you know, I wasn't the biggest, most famous martial artist of all time. You know, I have my own, I have my wall with the shiny things on it, but uh -huh. I'm still not the most famous martial arts guy. I'm not Bruce Lee or something uh -huh. like that. So, so I, um, we really, did, you know, had an understanding that that uh, distribution through other folks who had who had followings, um, whether they were famous people or they just had a lot of people on particular lists or fan pages, would be a very important aspect of what we we're doing. And the benefit was. Our email marketing, so our actual automated follow-up to conversion, to upsell, to future upsell, to consulting, mm -hmm. was a lot sharper than most folks. Because when I was running a physical martial arts presence in an 8,000-person town, I became hyper-obsessive uh -huh. around maximizing what I call profit per prospect. So making sure everybody is sub-segmented uh, sub and sub-targeted and communicated and marketed to with proper offers and proper timing, and that all of that is tested. Mm -hmm. So I had develop that obsession so when I could get affiliates, strategic partnerships as you had said, to send to my offers and my squeeze pages, mm -hmm. the conversions and the recurring were often even better than they'd make on their own products, even gotcha. though they're getting paid half uh, of what of what they're making with me. So, um, so, so was that, that kind of the deal is you reached out to them and said, you're going to get a kickback on anything yeah. I sell from you. That was kind of the arrangement? Yeah, and there's, there's a number of different ways I've done it and, and this is a really important uh, factor. So like, if we'd like to go into... Um, uh, sort of how we, how I, kind of got those strategic partnerships in the first place. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time, it's finding, it's finding uh, a solid synergy and finding something that you have that they don't. Even if you're not a big player. So I began in this game with nothing but scrap, probably like yourself, mm -hmm. scrap and better style. That's you know, right. You have That's have right. Shirts, I got to give you that. Um, so you had scrap and style. I, I really just had you know scrap and scrap and whatnot. But uh, but yeah. So I was out there writing for blogs. I mean, I was writing for the jujitsu magazines for all these other. Uh, uh, URLs in the jiu-jitsu space and the one benefit that I had is I had all these trusted relationships on these content oriented websites. So these guys might have had Facebook pages of 70,000 people. I might have had 2,000. Shucks, you know, it's nothing. Mm -hmm. But I could say, hey, you have products. I know, I know for a fact you've never been featured on any of these places. I, I could get in an interview with you. We could do six videos. Mm -hmm. um, I could put those videos in different blog posts and write fantastic blogs that these websites would be happy to post up. And then you'd be able to say featured on, featured on, featured on. We could okay. drive some affiliate traffic. Nobody else can give you that benefit. And in exchange, we'll work something out with email. And then that, that arrangement, that original idea of just burrowing into an area where most people are not active. Okay, mm -hmm. I will dominate blogs. That oh, cracked open just a ton of fan page and email uh, traffic floods. Uh, so, so figuring out again in this niche and space, most people have blank. Most people don't have blank. It really mm -hmm. didn't take me longer than a couple months to be able to write for all six of those sites, but nobody else wants to do that work. So now yeah. I have an interesting positioning. And once you do the first job with somebody, you make a small arrangement, you do a trade, they do a trade, you over deliver the heck out of it and you're a mm -hmm. fantastic affiliate. Now that's somebody you can in, do business with in the future. And ultimately, that's really what's carried us forward. Great automation mm -hmm. and really over delivering on initial engagements. You know, it makes me think about customer development. You know, we talk so much about knowing what the customer wants, but you have to have that same mindset with strategic partners partners. Yeah. What is it they really need and want? Yeah. And then it really looks, take inventory. What do I have? What do they have? What is an equitable, you know, kind of swap between yep. these skills and services? And then just like you said, over deliver. Yep. And you can get so much value out of big people, even when you're a flea, right? Tons, tons. If you have the right positioning and value. And again, you know, I've done it. I've done it. I've done it so many times now in, uh, in the martial arts niche. Now we're obviously moving into other spaces. Um, is, uh, is, figuring out how you can help them without even talking to them first. So there were some folks that sell, like there's, there's a particular person who was selling a, a, a equipment, a grappling dummy actually, right? Mm -hmm. So they were selling this dummy. And, and I signed up as affiliate without them knowing me. I posted some blogs without them knowing who I was. Mm -hmm. I sent a little bit of email traffic without them knowing anything. Got a ton of uh, momentum with, a, with initially very small effort. Then went back to them and said, hey, I, I went in dabbling with this thing. I put forth, you know, I, I took a couple steps forward, and this is what we got. I actually have a game plan to really blow this up. Um, if you guys are happy to catch up in the next, you know, uh, week or so, I mean, you know, I got, I, I have some pretty cool plans. I'd be happy to, to chat it up. Mm -hmm. And then that's a conversation that's harder for them to to deny than the the fifteenth person who says, "Hey, can we do something where we market online and the internet?" So I yeah. just went out and just made sales for them, and yeah. then. 
followed up afterwards. So no one ignores sales. No one. Saying? No yeah, one ignores no, yeah, sales. You can't, right? I mean, you can't even if you wanted to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You it's, just, it's, it's the drug dealer model. You know, the first one's free, and you'll see how good it is, and then we'll, we'll talk an arrangement after that. I like it, the drug dealer model, or or the free puppy model, right? Free yeah, for even, a week that, puppy. That's a more tame give, version of it. <laughs> yeah, you give it you give it to the kid, and then and then you can't take the puppy away from the kid. Exactly. Um, Show your value before you ask for anything. Exactly. Henry Ford has a great quote about that. Um, but uh, but yeah, no, that's exactly what it was. And now you know we're working on doing the same things with. I mean, this this is this was me in the martial arts space, mm-hmm. and we're now working on doing this in so many other niches and industries, and obviously with you know customers and clients who are in all sorts of different spaces. But yeah. strategy is strategy, and making those connections, if, especially if you have a better funnel than everybody else, mm-hmm. can facilitate some really really solid lead flow much better than the trickle along I'm going to build an SEO presence and eventually I'll get big two years from now for me I wanted those pumps coming in early and fast yeah. and it was just about finding where I could plug myself in and be of value yeah well let's jump in and talk about that email funnel a little bit because I sure. noticed on your website um, and this is just one little piece of it I'm sure is that you have like an opt-in you get a free guide give me your yeah. email address that's kind of the traditional stuff tell it me is. what's going on behind the scenes there was that kind of the beginning of your Going down this path, and what does it become? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, that that was that was the beginning, uh, and it and in many ways it still is. So there's there's a number of different ways that that you can parse folks out. So for me, I don't have let's say a single channel where people will learn about me and then eventually buy things. Mm-hmm. I have a number of different splintered and contextual opt-ins that let me know based on just the, for the fact that you're opting in on this page. I already know things about you. So it's not you opt in and then I have to find things out based on the value prop, based on the blog this was linked to, based on the email offer that was sent out for this, based on the place and time that you had come across this page, you fit this mold to some extent. So and I know you're a certain qualifying number of things. them and putting yeah. them in buckets, not based on data they give you, but based on data you know about them. Yep. So that way there's not a barrier for them to hand over personal information, but yet yeah. you still know so much about their yep. desires, what's going to incentivize them, all that kind of stuff. Totally. And then and then just by lead source alone, I can determine how I want to follow up with them. And then of course there's also places where I will give people drop downs. And I'll give them drop downs and an ability to enter their particular category. And I recommend this for any major business that any any business out there that has a main website with just a blatant opt in, you know, a really really horrendous and borderline offensively bad call to action is join our newsletter. Um, <laughs> yeah. but uh you know, I, I'm going to hope it's not that bad. But yeah. but let's say let's say you have some kind of basic call to action as opposed to just to name an email. Oftentimes, even just a smidge of customization, maybe between one of three categories, one of four categories, that alone, the targeting that you can do based on tiny, minute amounts of information will make each subject line and the content of each email so much more relevant yeah. that your open rates and your click-through rates will be so much deeper and farther. And for me, I mean, I'm in the business – whether I'm working with my business or I'm working on other people's businesses, I'm in the business of engagement, I'm in the business of e-commerce, I'm in the business of setting appointments, and that's all eyeballs on offers, really. Mm-hmm. So that's that's the world I'm in. So if it's a little bit of customization up front, again, you have a catch-all website, a main homepage, a little bit of a drop-down, now every single email that hits that person's website, it's not, oh, this is from that company, it's this is for me, this is yeah. for me, this is for me. If you can... If you can even add fifty percent, never mind a hundred percent, which is not unusual, by the way, to your open rates, give me a break. Yeah. I mean, it's ridiculous return on investment. It's all about plugging and playing those strategies. Yeah. Now, let me ask you a question that you and I know the answer to, but I want to make sure it's clear for everybody else. Yeah, yeah. You know, why is it a bad call to action? Join our newsletter. Like, what is wrong with that? And what's the right call to action there? Yeah. It, well, uh, the right call to action would depend on the business. I give suppose. us a generic example. You yeah, know? yeah. So, so of course. Um, it, it's it's a very generic example. But I, I would say you know um, if you're a business that's interesting enough to have some semblance of a white paper, some variety of different white papers. If like yourself, Brunson, you have killer interviews, um, and you know you opt in to see the rest of this interview and maybe get access to a couple other ones that are mm-hmm. fantastic that you know people are interested because they just watch 32 seconds. Yeah. So they're at least 32 seconds interested, which <laughs> yeah. is probably better than most YouTube videos get. So um, so. It, Having some something of value, so an explicit. I like to make it so that it's not. Um, you will periodically hear about us about vague things. It's just not. It doesn't call to me. It doesn't yeah. do. Anything. So I like to have a lot of different landing pages. But if we're going vague, at least have something tangible and something present now. What are they going to get when there they opt? Go. What are they going to immediately get access to? Because that'll trigger their brain not to say, 
oh, you know, I feel compelled emotionally to take you know, a second out of my internet uh, scooping through to, to enter my email to hear from you guys once a month. Not really, but if you have something that can call to them, even if it's catch-all, even if it's you know, basic like a white paper about and then a core value proposition, mm -hmm. much, much, much better generally in terms of conversion rates. Yeah, so you want something specific they're going to get, not a newsletter. That's not specific. That's vague. Something yeah. specific is... Right now, I'm going to send you this guy to teach you how to do these things. Exactly. And now they know that in a few minutes, their email is going to have that in the inbox. And there's that dopamine of like, yes, this is what's coming, you know? Precisely. The newsletter Precisely. doesn't do that for anybody. No. Um, you yeah. get it two weeks later and you're like, do I even care to open this? You know, Do I yeah. even remember what this website was? Yeah, the dopamine, as you had mentioned. That's why you have all the classic internet marketing examples of you know the top three blank. And you'll even mm -hmm. see, I mean, I'm in the... You know, we're running around in the biotech uh, world out here in Cambridge. I get to see a lot of cool websites. You know, there's there's even webinars in biotech marketing to huge <laughs> companies. You know, trying to get pharma folks onto webinars, and it's the top five blank that you don't want to just because it's a meat. You know, it's it's yeah. a tangible number. It's the 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 fundamentals of marketing. The fundamentals of marketing, small small or large. So exactly like you said, yeah. you know, getting that hit of dopamine and that benefit is important. And we can laugh at those tactics until we're browsing around the internet and realizing we're falling prey to them. Also, like when yeah. I see that, it makes yeah. me perk up when it's something I want. And I'm like, all right, I'll give my email. Let me get that guide <laughs> real quick. Let me see what they got. And so Using we can my... laugh when we're on the on the producer side, but on the consumer side, it's working when we're the consumer. It's just it's the way our brains are wired. It's not anything more than that. <laughs> yeah, it, it totally is what it is. And there's no and there's absolutely no need. I mean, you know, there's there's really blatant and almost kind of boringly kind of you know cheesy examples of it. Mm -hmm. But um, but those same fundamentals of marketing, the ones that we're talking about, and maybe laughing it up about those same principles and tenets apply across the board across industries. Like you said, it's a very human yeah. in terms of how we respond. So you're getting the emails. You're getting the emails through uh, different landing pages, different opt-in forms, different URL addresses. You're using that data either from the source or maybe a little bit of a drop down for them to like fill out a little bit of who they are. But basically, yep. now you have a bunch of emails and some data. Now, walk me through what's next. Yeah. Uh, how are you using that data? How are you using those emails to really, like you said, have a funnel that's way more efficient than what other people are used to? What does it look like after that? Totally. And, and it, gets, it, gets, uh, it gets pretty um, complicated in a good way, not complicated. Yeah. I, I, for me, it's complicated in a good way, right? So the back <laughs> of my <laughs> – I leverage Infusionsoft as one of the softwares that I use. Other people are into Pardot or HubSpot or um, Get Response. There's more, more or less features. But in terms of uh, basic functions, one thing I will say is that um, when, when somebody initially opts in, there's a number of things that are happening right off the bat. So they're already receiving a, a quote-unquote yellow brick road based on what I believe, based on where they came from, the limited information I know. They're going to ride a yellow brick road of the next most logical purchase for them, at which point they're going to be on another yellow brick road for the next most logical purchase for them. Okay. Um, so are those on, drip campaigns? Is a yeah, yellow brick road a drip yeah, campaign? Yeah, yellow brick road of drip campaign of se sequential email marketing. Okay. And being able to test those sales pages or even being able to test those sequences is so tremendously important. Because, for example, Brunson, I mean, I, you know, I can give plenty of my own examples here. Mm -hmm. But if, if, you know, I hop in the back of a, a company that, um, that's, that's most people, so hey, you'll be able to say this too. Most startups, smart startups, anybody you've talked to for sure, mm -hmm. they'll tell you 20 ways that they're driving traffic usually. Sure. And, they'll, and any, anyone who's worth their weight in celery salt is going to tell you that <laughs> they uh, – that that uh, there's a good measurement, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I have, no, I have no idea what you're talking about. I've never heard of that. You got <laughs> celery eat, salt. <laughs> yeah, celery salt. It's delicious. All right, I'll but look it's it up. also regardless. So um, they'll tell you that they're testing those methods as well. We're driving traffic in these ways. We're testing it. But you say, okay, after they opt in, what happens then? Well, we have this drip campaign. Well, what are you testing in the drip campaign? Well, nothing. Oh, geez, that's a damn shame. Uh -huh. So most people aren't testing a bit. So usually, you know, for me, just peering into the back of those systems being like, is any of that tested? No? Okay. Well, it's basically impossible not to have improvement uh, criteria in there. So for us, um, we have those drip campaigns and we're always split testing the landing pages, split testing the offers, split testing the upsells and determining which ones are taking and which ones aren't and sending people through a continuously refining funnel, which is why we can extract a lot of profits from a relatively arbitrary and nominal niche being yeah. Brazilian jiu-jitsu on the internet. So you're um, basically so doing for the funnel, what most people do for the website itself. You're yeah. just putting way more emphasis on the email side of it instead of just playing with the text on the website nonstop. That's exactly it. What, all, all the, the structure and order of those offers and how those are being laid out, if none mm -hmm. of that is ever tinkered with, it's just like your front-end website. If your front-end website's never tinkered with, 
you're losing some additional opportunity and additional growth. The mm. back end is just as easy to test, just that most people don't do it. Yeah. So it's a very easy place for me to step in and see immediate opportunity, and that's where we started in our own business. The other thing that I do, Brunson, I think will be helpful for folks out there is uh, we always have some level of uh, surveying or additional information to be gleaned. And there's a number of ways you can pull this off. So the best time to get information from people is when you just got information from people. Mm -hmm. Simply, or similarly, the best time to get money from people is when you just got money from people. The big right? mo, so, momentum. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so upsells and whatnot. Uh, so for us, for information, as soon as someone opts in, even if it's just a single drop down or just a name email or just an email, that's a great time to pop them right into a quick survey for another perk, another bonus. Not just, hey, can you please just fill all this out? Hey, your thing's already in your inbox, but give me this other page of info. Say, hey, great, thank you so much. You know, we also uh, created an entire video tutorial around that same guide. I'm happy to pop you right over to that page. Simply fill out this survey. It means a lot to us to get an understanding, and I'll send the video along right with your PDF. Gotcha. Now, I mean, you're going to get 80% of folks to fill out eight fields, mm -hmm. and eight fields is data. Huge. <laughs> and data is tremendously valuable. I don't care if you're selling on the phone and you already know what it is that they're desirous of. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you're selling via email and now you know all their interests, you know their age, you know their industry, you know the number of employees, mm -hmm. whatever it is. That's going to allow massively targeted uh, information. And I even have multiple surveys that will kick off. So if people don't fill out that initial survey, over the course of their automated marketing, they'll also, let's say maybe 11 or 12 days in on a Sunday, get a message for that survey if they didn't take it initially. Yeah. Then another 11 or 10 or what have you kind of days, they'll get another little reminder. It's not abrasive, it's not pushy, but it's a, it's a free little bonus for filling out the survey. I know it's something they're interested in, so it'd be cool if they filled it out. If mm -hmm. they don't, it's not a big deal, but I will follow them along, making sure that I get as many people as possible to really just dish out all the information we'd need to really make the most of, uh, of that, that email list and, and especially the offers we present. And yeah. that's what takes us into database marketing, which I'd be happy to talk about as well because it's so powerful. Yeah, let's go there next. But let me ask you this. Big. You know, when it comes to website optimization, kind of the front end, what's happening on the page, we know what elements there are to play with. We know sure. there's a headline. We know there's a subhead. We know there's some kind of imagery. Like, it, it's a known quantity more so. With email funnels, it's not as known what elements, what levers there are to actually pull. So tell me, like, what are the five to ten pieces of the puzzle that you're actually trying to optimize? A few that you've mentioned, right? You mentioned yep. uh, offers. You mentioned yep. discounts. You mentioned surveys. Um, what else? Like, what is it that you're rearranging? Gotcha. You're putting in different orders. You're trying different numbers with. What are those Absolutely. base elements you're working with? Yep. Uh, great, great call, Brunson. Um, so a, a number of different things to, to think about. Number one, there there certainly is no less factors to tinker with on the back end, just nobody really talks about it. So there's sure. plenty of people that probably even been on this show that are great at driving a ton of traffic. I'm okay at that with strategic partnerships. I'm, I wouldn't call myself the best pay-per-click guy. What I get paid for is profit per prospect, implementing mm -hmm. the systems that do that. It just so happens that that's less talked about. So the, I believe that there's at least as many, if not more, because that's a process. That's long. Mm -hmm. uh, my landing page is my landing page. Mm -hmm. my, my process for follow-up, I mean, infinite depth. So easy easy uh, factors to tinker around with that are super quick to implement for any startups who are tuned in now uh, would be thinking about the positioning of your email. So think about you know what you know and what you, based on customer feedback and all those things, what is the core value prop for this person and why are they here? And, and if you have a couple competing ideas, maybe slight variations of a similar idea, de de determining which one's going to resonate more, R write your same front end six or front end 12 based on flavor number one and flavor number two. Okay. So find that core value prop, frame it in a couple different ways depending on what you think is going to be most valuable, and then test it with your subject line, with your call to action text, with your first paragraph, with the factors that matter most in email, mm -hmm. and then see what at the end of those 12, who's making the most bucks. Similarly, you can test out timing. Very easy idea here mm -hmm. is do we go with just weekdays and then not do weekends and then just go back to weekdays? Do we do once a day for as long as they're in with us? Do we do spaced out every two or three days? Let's send a couple cohorts through and let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. Another factor that's very important to consider, which a lot of people neglect tremendously, is thank you pages. So what is the thank you page? Are we able to present an offer right then and there? Are we, um, are we able to go into a survey? Which one's going to ultimately be more profitable? When they go through the survey, are they then more likely to take the offer or are they more likely to take the offer right then and there, depending on how we present it? Mm -hmm. Similarly, again, what is the first offer that they get hit with? Is it a $12.95 price point? Is it a $95 price point? 
And how are we, again, remember that whole flavor thing. Mm -hmm. I, I know why people are buying this, but there's this hue to it. And certain people like this, and then there's this hue to it. And if they're all coming through the same channel, let's see which one of those hues and flavors hits the hardest. Mm -hmm. So tinkering with that front-end offer, I mean, for me, the offer would probably be the biggest. But those are a number of the factors right off the bat. And hopefully those are useful for the folks out there right now. Any of those. I mean, pick one and implement it, and mm -hmm. you're going to learn something about your back-end business. It's so, like I said, I mean, I'm here in the CIC, so I'm talking to startups all day. 20 ways to test the front end, zero ways to test the back end. It's yeah. a damn shame. Damn yeah. shame. No, I mean, I, that is the insight of this interview, is that the front end is being tested, the back end funnels are not, nope. and Neglect. there's so much money to be made there. I mean, you think about Dave McClure's funnel, you know, the famous, you know, R metric pirate funnel, and it's very much a front end funnel, you know? And even the way I think, when I approach things, I think front end funnel, and yep. you have a, a, a a way to see things of what's behind the scenes and how valuable the rest of the iceberg is below the surface. It is an iceberg, totally. Yeah, and so it's just a great insight and I hope people really hear that. And so is this yeah. kind of what gave rise to your new business, CLV Boost, is you did this it stuff, did. you knew you were onto something, now let me get some clients doing this. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it wasn't even necessarily just, you know, let, let me, uh, let me get some clients. I mean, I, I have a number of different aspirations out, outside of the, the pure consultancy domain, but, but I thought about it like this, Brunson. I mean, I began with my very neurotic email marketing and, and uh, uh, profit per prospect metrics in a small town, so I had to get very good at these things. Then we took it to other, other niches and domains, but I look at it now, and there are startups that don't just have the potential for a little bit of ROI in a way that'd be interesting in a little niche, but who might have millions of users. Mm. And what does it mean to up even two or three percent? I mean, most any untested back end, if I can't do two or three percent, I mean, you know, I'll pay I'll pay out money. Like yeah. I'll pay people money if I well, can't. You wouldn't be worth your weight in celery salt in that case. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Brunson, you, you you did it, man. You did it. So long as so long as you give me give me a little bit of a mention on one of those in a future interview, that I'll, I'll probably uh, I'll, I'll see what that. I can do. I'll try to work it in. That'll, that'll be fantastic. <laughs> so yeah. So the, the the factor is, you know, there's startups out there with the potential for millions of users, and there's also uh, folks with five or six figure price points. You know, people who are selling massive software mm -hmm. or who are working in real estate or different areas like this. And there's there's startups that can take these things and scale not take them into small niches. So applying these strategies now in those domains is what's most interesting to me. Yeah. And uh, a lot of the time, it's just, you know, it's finding what's not being tested. It's plugging little holes, seeing big returns, and finding where the rest of the uh, the opportunity is. But yeah, that was exactly it. You know, we're, it was working so well here. There's businesses with massive scale. What can those little tweaks mean? And let's go in there and let's make them happen. You know, that's yeah. what CLV Boost is all about. CLV also stands for, I should always say, customer lifetime value. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's why I assumed I wasn't 100% sure. Yep. CLV Boost, so boosting the customer lifetime value. If you're not testing the back end, boosting the customer lifetime value is more than possible. Yeah. So um, so that's that's essentially our job and proposition. We work with all kinds of different startups in that world now. Yeah, and you mentioned you know kind of the five, the four and five and six figure price points for things. Yeah. It, does this kind of thinking work better when there's a higher price point? Is that when there's more to get out of the back end funnel system optimization when you're charging 10k a pop for something? Yeah, um well, it, it differs. I, I don't know if it's any more important, to be honest. I think if you have, if you're doing, for example, my mar my online martial arts business, for the most part, is very hands off. I, I only talk to a certain number of folks who we do uh, consulting for in this marketing automation. We have a number of those people. We have uh, some people that'll do skill development consulting with, but um, but mostly it's hands off, lower price points. But it's really important that I have all those architectures in place mm -hmm. because I can't handle them. But then again, we're, we're selling on the phone or something like that, those bigger price points you had mentioning. Um, it does warrant, I'll tell you what it does, uh, Brunson, is, is if, if your price points are higher, sometimes early on it will warrant a richer database and a richer software. So it's not necessarily more important or less important, but it will allow you to use more tools and it will often warrant you using a couple more tools. Because now when you and you uh, So refining how you can get someone to an e-commerce purchase is great, mm -hmm. but if you're selling five or six figures, most people aren't pushing a button, right? Dropping a hundred grand. There's some kind of phone there or a some meeting. kind of connection. <laughs> exactly, some kind of human connection. So imagine bumping your uh, your conversion to appointment in a in a business where you have six figure sales mm -hmm. by let's say seven percent over the course of two months. I mean, it's if it's deal. untested, yeah, if it's untested, it should be more than that. But if it, even if it's relatively tested and refined, seven percent over the course of a year, six figure sales, you do X number a month. 
that's that's dollars. Yeah. So I'd say it's more important, but I would say you can add a lot more bells and whistles early and see some cool things happen. Yeah, and one of the bells and whips, whistles, you mentioned this word twice now, database. So break that yeah. down for me. What is that? When you say database, database email marketing, what does that mean to yeah. you and how are you using that? Big time. And, and this is tremendously important as well, Brunson. And, and I'd like to, again, have a lot of actionableness here. So yeah. for me, this is uh, this is really of passion to me because this is how our initial martial arts business worked and where I'm taking so many other folks who've really neglected opt-ins. So some people are so sophisticated that they have a yellow brick road, usually maybe six or 12 emails. You know, and they're, mm-hmm. they're uh, super sophisticated. Um, but, but usually after that, it's a generic broadcast message, right? Every mm-hmm. month, you know, they'll send you something. Every week, they'll send you something. Um, when you have someone who's dropped four grand, someone who's dropped zero, someone who opens every email, someone who's opened none, someone who is their only, they are their only employee, someone who has 200 employees, Everybody getting the same communication. Mm -hmm. Um, For me, it very much shouldn't be that way. So parsing out that back end list, and instead of rotating a generic offer, so here's an example. So in my opinion, that's you know, as a marketer, marketer, that's sloppy to the point of borderline offensively bad marketing. (laughs) So if you take a company like LL Bean, okay, Mm -hmm. LL Bean does not do marketing for boys; they do marketing for men. Now, why is that? Because LL Bean has to sell out, uh, has to mail out catalogs. Now you can't screw up with catalogs. You understand? I mean, because mm-hmm. you, you gotta, you gotta, you. I mean, imagine the rainforest. I mean, they have to just destroy it. Yeah. They have to destroy, it. and then they have to turn that into paper. They gotta put ink on that. They have to mail that out. That's money. Yeah. So those people, if you follow what LL Bean does, they don't once a month mail a catalog to everybody. No, no, no. They're not sloppy marketers. What they do is they'll have different catalogs for different buyers at different price points with different demographics, with different slide-in offers. Some people will just get a postcard. Some people will get email that will follow up with that, and all of that is being tested. Mm -hmm. That's database marketing. It's not playing around with your email list. It's understanding the receptivity and the proper offers and proper engagement of different levels of your database and marketing and rotating your circulation through all of them. If L.L. Bean just sent out a, a catalog to everybody, A, the rainforest would just be destroyed. I mean, mm-hmm. we'd have, you know, we wouldn't have air to breathe and things like that. Mm-hmm. B, they'd lose a lot of money right away. So yeah. a lot of people can get away with being sloppy. I like to think, I like to tell, you know, startups or any other business, pretend your database, you know these things about them, pretend that you are L.L. Bean and that your generic message is a catalog. And if that thing loses money, you're mm-hmm. losing a ton. A lot of people can get sloppy with email, but when you think that way, I got gotcha. you. You may not lose a lot of money, but you can make so much more by just refining it. So we that's why happy with email because email is cheap, therefore it doesn't warrant our attention. When yeah. in fact the upside is so big, Huge. we are losing money. We just don't know it because of the way we're framing the problem. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So the, the pain isn't isn't uh, loud enough. Mm-hmm. But from my experience, even if you just subsegment your broadcast into three groups and you see what that does to open rates, tiny tiny adjustment, same message, different subject line, different first sentence, three yeah. different groups. Um, that by itself, in terms of how many eyeballs land on your offers, is usually enough of a smile on the face to make it pretty clear, hey, there's an upside here. Yeah. You know, so that's another very important facet for folks to consider. Absolutely. Now, let me ask you this. There's people watching this, and they're salivating, wanting to do this to their business. Big so time. let me ask you a question. How much of this is Infusionsoft and you knowing how to use Infusionsoft? Yep. How much is it is specialized skill that they're not going to have, Infusionsoft is not going to give them, and they're going to have to spend five years in the trenches messing up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I certainly, I mean, I've probably spent uh, I don't know, close to 80 grand in the last two years on uh, internet and, and marketing automation, kind of co- coaching, consulting, flying all over the place uh, and learning this kind of thing. With that being said, you don't necessarily need that training, but it certainly helps. Sure. Um, there's, there's, uh, there's not as much out there about this as there is about, you know, converting websites, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, buy button colors. You know, there's a lot more blog posts on like you know Neil Patel and guys like that, but he doesn't really talk so much about this. And a lot of the other folks uh, don't either. So I would say a little bit if you're really going to refine it, having some uh, some specialized knowledge is helpful, mm-hmm. and really understanding the software you're functioning in is helpful, and, and making sure it's the right software. You know, yeah. I was just talking to a company today that's using Constant Contact, and they their business just requires so much more functionality than Constant mm-hmm. Contact is even capable of. So sometimes it's knowing when you kind of have to break out. So I would say there are places online, events are probably the best source of this kind of information. If you're going to take your email seriously, um, learning from that is useful. On, on Seal, on Seal VBoost right now, we did, a, we did a white paper on a whole bunch of basic and easy to implement ideas. Mm-hmm. So I try as, as best I can to make this as, you know, do this, 
test it, and one of those variations will make more money than what you do. Mm -hmm. And that's on clvboost.com. We have a white paper. Other than that, I mean, events are a great place. Um, and, uh, yeah, if you want to take it serious, like you know, Brunson, I mean, there's plenty of websites to learn. If you want to take it really serious, obviously, you go to the folks that really know it. Yeah. So let me ask you this. Um, you know, you've seen so many back-end funnels, so many email funnels, more than most, more than me. Um, yeah. You've probably seen trends and start spotting trends. And obviously, you have to A-B test everything. It's different exactly. for every company. But caveat, is there something where it almost always works? Like this thing, when you do it, it works most of the time for most people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, one thing that I would say right off the bat, in terms of um, in terms of basic to-do, so we're thinking about actionables for a startup who's out there. They're like, mm -hmm. I want to leverage some part of this. Exactly. Um, Give them something to start with that you just yep. think might work. Something, something to start with right off the bat is finding a way for your thank you page to somehow potentially lead to an offer. doesn't mean it needs to be an ugly sales page. Mm -hmm. But if someone comes into your email list hot, which sometimes they do, they shouldn't have to wait a while or wait until they build up the courage to call you to take a further step to set an appointment or to actually make a small front-end purchase. So okay. if your thank you page dies and there is no, even if I was the hottest prospect in the world, I have no more further steps forward, that's an error. It's a blatant, blatant error. So okay. being able to fix that and say, what is the next step forward? Is it a small front-end purchase? Is it uh, potentially a free trial of some sort? And is there a way that, not in an offensive way, thanks for opting in, get your free trial. I mean, there's more classy ways of going about that, mm -hmm. giving some case studies and interesting calls to action for the free trial in a way that is informative, that's educational. Or, again, those same kind of case studies. I often like uh, some sort of friendly, short case studies after a, uh, an opt-in, and then an opportunity to set an appointment. That thank you page has to have the ability to take a hot prospect and move them forward. Otherwise, you're losing momentum on people that are good. The other thing that's uh, very important to, to take action on is thinking about how you can parse on the front end. If you only have one yellow brick road, again, it's an error. I mean, I don't know a business that's an exception. Mm -hmm. unless, you're, unless you pride yourself in super stodginess and people trust you based on that, um, and I don't know really any of those businesses. Uh -huh. There's probably a few of them. But, uh, but unless that's the case, different people are looking for different things. Different mm -hmm. people are in different positions. So can you take even just the first, even just the subject line and the first paragraph and tweak it and craft it based on whatever the major criterion are for you? If your software is a service, maybe it's size of company or industry. If you're selling to uh, consumers, maybe even gender alone. Just mm -hmm. tweaking that subject line huge jack in those open rates and click-through rates. So parsing early on contextually or with an early drop-down is, again, if you have two if you have two funnels that are hyper-succinct to those variations of your core prospect or one, you're mm -hmm. going to see the two win more often than not. In fact, I, I've never seen them lose when it's been tested and really, really refined. Yeah. So that's, that's another plug-and-play strategy that people need to take advantage of. Yeah, and just to make sure people are clear, when you say Yellow Brick Road, what you're referring to, and tell me if I'm wrong, yes. is a path to profitability which is going to be different for different segments yes. in your list. Always so they will. each have a different route that maximizes the profit, the profit per prospect, you know, yep. um, for that person, but it's a different route. Yes. Um, you know, one thing I've seen that I think is really clever is when you first go to a site, it says, you know, you click a button, I am a fill in the blank, or yeah. I am a fill in the blank. So yeah. it's almost like right away on the home page, above the fold, you're picking one of two routes because they yep. know you might be on this side of the equation or you might be on that side of the equation. And it's a high level way to kind of get you into one of two camps at least, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then that yellow brick road is more tailored. And interestingly enough, you don't see this done in places where you really think it should be. You know, I opted in recently to, uh, I tested this with a bunch of marketing automation software companies just mm -hmm. to see if they're eating their own dog food. <laughs> and, and, and I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I have nothing but respect for HubSpot, by the way. I think their blog is phenomenal. I think they're, I think they're on the cutting edge of a whole bunch of different things. Mm -hmm. But I filled out their front end survey, maybe on the oddball, with totally different size companies, totally different industry, and got the same messages with the same smiling guy's face and the same text, the same subject line. Uh. So, man, you, what, like, how about a case study for a big company or a case study for a little company? How about a case study for this industry or a case study for this industry? How much more social proof and resonance and more likely yeah. am I am to, to respond to that email, to make that phone call? So yeah. any of those refinements on the front end, I mean, th that's an example where all they have to do is change their email because they're already asking for a lot of data. But like you said, can we say I'm A, I'm A, and mm -hmm. then have them make that pick and have different trajectories or path to profits? Very, very I thought about that for Growth Hacker TV because right now we don't have that. We're not as sophisticated as no. what you're you know, saying we should be. And I thought when they first come to the site, it should be I'm a founder, 
I'm a marketer, or you know, at least those two, because Hardcore. those are two different camps that I know are both coming here with different Hardcore. needs. And then yeah. there's other, you know, I'm a CEO of not a startup, you know. <laughs> yep. I mean, man, Brunson. I, I, well, you know, no peer pressure or anything, but uh, but with a little bit of peer pressure, I would say you totally, <laughs> you totally should. I mean, because yeah. because here's the thing. I mean, if if you have, you know. All these founders who are paying you every month for a reason, they have those reasons. And other founders are going to be like, damn. And if you have marketers that are paying for a reason mm-hmm. and you lay out those reasons, you know, I, I, I say that's well, well, well more than worth testing. And obviously your content's so good. Um, and I'm hoping I'll fit into that category. That's why oh, I'm talking about. I can so already fast. tell you you will. I can uh, already tell you that much. <laughs> but, uh, but one of the reasons your content's so good that people are sharing and, and there's there's been buzz. I mean, I heard about you through the grapevine and maybe two or three different occasions before, you know, I was slapped in and, and getting your stuff on a monthly or a weekly or however often you're pumping it out. Mm-hmm. So um so yeah, I mean that's that's completely it. I mean, I, I would uh I would I would say you're in the exact same boat there. Yeah, no, and it, it's gonna be on the list, and that's one of the things too, is you know, when you're a growth hacker you have more levers to pull than other people because you know more about how the internet works. Yeah. And so you're drowning in opportunity. And that's oh. kind of where we're at, where it's like, there's so many things I could do oh, of course. to of go course. up and to the right that it's just a matter of, you know, stack it's, ranking it's, a list and then working through it. <laughs> and the, the cool thing about about uh, this, what we're talking about, Brunson, and I, I completely get where you're coming from. Number one, A, at CLV Boost, a lot of people don't want to write that email copy. And mm-hmm. part of like the... I'll pay you and you do it thing is, hey, we're running around doing all these things that we really get. Yeah. How would you plug in those variations and then we'll, we'll run away and well, then we'll that's just... That's why it's a business. Numbers. I mean, that's why you're meeting a need that's because why it's a business, right? you but, know but, you can make numbers go up and to the right, but exactly. you know they're busy. Yeah, yeah, but you know they're busy as all heck. Um, and and the, other, the other thing is it's a one-time grind. So this is one of those things where if I want to implement a sales team, now I obviously have more people on the payroll. I obviously have more people to manage, a little bit more training expense maybe. If I set up an, an automation architecture, some people want me on for a long time advising them. And I've had people for, as soon as I started doing this, my, my first marketing automation, internet marketing client is actually still with me. But some folks are just build it and, and get out. You know, Give us the tactical advice, train us on it and get out. Um, and it's, it's automation architecture that, okay, now I, I can run away, I can go to Cuba and, uh, you know, I don't know what they do in Cuba, smoke cigars and drink uh, umbrella drinks or something. Yeah. And that email funnel will work exactly the way I built it for, it, it'll put in eight times more work with no more work from now on out. Mm-hmm. So it's one of those levers that you can twist once and see that return. It's just about, it's just about putting in that one-time grind. Yeah, and I'm sure that, you know, you've had the experience of seeing the one-time grind produce so much like, that for you it's at the top yeah, of the yeah. list on any list of what we're going <laughs> to yeah. do next. We all have our bias, right? We all have our bias. So, yeah. yeah, no, that's great. That's why we have different people on with different expertises so they can really get into our heads. This is important. Please focus on this. Big time. You know, and that's what yeah. we need. Uh, well, Dan, this has been just an incredible interview. We've covered so many yeah. different things. I have one last question that I yeah. ask to all of our guests. Um, you can kind of take it any direction you want, but what's the best advice you have for any startup that's trying to grow? Well, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna go with um, if I'm gonna go with what I know best and something mm-hmm. that would be practical, it would be to experiment with um, whether it's in marketing automation. By the way, it's not just email. So this could be phone. This could be if you do any direct mail. Experiment with. Remember, I talked about those hues and flavors. Those sort of you know what the core value prop is, but there's different ways to frame it and different mm-hmm. ways to put it. Um, if you have main channels where a lot of people are running through, whether it's a first appointment and you have a script that you're speaking to, whether it's a phone call you have a script, whether it's an email marketing funnel that you're communicating with them, um, take the, take cohorts and take that hue and tweak that hue a bit. And if you can if you can eke that out, then that that understanding that that deeper sort of understanding of your customer can now be used across every channel. So if it works in email and that wording mm-hmm. tends yeah. to work, now how can you plug that into the sales script? How can you plug that into your direct mail? How can that end up on landing pages? Because that can give you so much richness that transfers across the board. So I would say um, make, some, make some short experiments there, tinker with it, and even a little bit better wording and better terminology and better sense of what that flavor of value is that this person is looking for will transfer to every aspect of your marketing. So I would highly advise that. That's a great advice to end on. Dan, thank you so much again for coming on Growth Hacker TV. Cool. Thanks, Bronson. Pleasure to be here.